الفاتحة أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد ثم الصلاة والسلام على آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المذلومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه وهو أصدق القائلين واصبر نفسك مع الذين يدعون ربهم بالغداة والعشي ولا تعد عيناك أنهم تريد زينة الحياة الدنيا ولا تطع من أغفلنا قلبه أن ذكرنا واتبع هواه وكان أمره فرطا صلى الله عليه وسلم The ayah of Quran that I have had the honor of reciting before you is from Surah Al-Kahf, chapter 18 of the Quran, verse 28, in which Allah speaks to his beloved Prophet Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because the address is in the singular. Wasbir nafsaka, you, O Habib. But it applies to all those who follow him, then to the mu'mineen. And bear with patience yourself. Wasbir nafsaka, ma'alladina yad'una rabbahum bil ghadati wal ashiyi yuriduna wajahu. Bear with patience with those who call out to their Lord and supplicate him morning and night. That means continuously. Seeking nothing but closeness to their Lord, seeking proximity, seeking a higher consciousness and greater awareness of their Creator and their source and origin. Yuriduna wajhahu. Wala ta'adu aynaka anhum turidu zinat al hayatid dunya. And do not be distracted in your vision and in your goal and in your single minded pursuit by those who are distracted and attracted by the beauty of this world. In other words, the constant remembrance of Allah morning and night stands in opposition to being distracted by zinatul hayat dunya. And do not obey or follow or listen to one whose heart we have made heedless from our remembrance. وَاتَّبَعَ هَوَاهُ And you will see that he is constantly running after his desires and his lust. وَكَانَ أَمْرُهُ فُرُطَ And if you look at such a person whose heart is veiled from our remembrance and is constantly running after his desires, you will see that he does not have any single goal in life. His affairs are all scattered. وَكَانَ أَمْرُهُ فُرُطَ Today he runs after this, tomorrow he runs after that. Today this is the goal, tomorrow that is the goal. He has no sense of purpose that this is the end that I need to get to. He is just running here and there based on his physical needs and desires. Now, this verse speaks of very many different themes and I've used this verse last year as well to speak on different ideas like Hawa, for example, what Taba'a Hawahu. But what I wish to do this afternoon, inshallah, with the barakah of Abba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. Is talk about this idea of living life with with consciousness versus living life with a sense of heedlessness 
and this idea of being a ghafil versus being constantly in the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the verse speaks wala tuti man aghfalna qalbahu an dhikrina and do not follow one whose heart is heedless of our remembrance broadly speaking what this verse is doing is it is dividing all of humanity and all of us in particular as Muslims into two groups there is one group that is heedless that is ghafil and there is one group that is in a state of wakefulness that is conscious that is aware and the dhikr here is not simply recitation with the lips where I sit on the prayer mat and do subhanallah 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 all morning all night but my heart is somewhere else my desires are something else but this state of complete presence in the now and wakefulness and consciousness now the natural question to this then is how do I measure myself and identify which group I belong to most of us out of a sense of humility would say I'm in a state of ghafla I'm not in a state of wakefulness but there are degrees even in the state of ghafla and in the state of wakefulness so I want to place myself somewhere on this continuum from heedlessness to complete wakefulness the way to understand this is to first look at what are the sources or inputs to our experience as humans in this life we know we come to this world from the wombs of our mothers and we will live here for a short while some will live for four decades some five some six some seven nobody lives for more than 10 decades there are very few that cross the age of 100 and those who reach even 100 they're usually not famous for anything other than their age in other words even though we strive for a long life very often once we get to an old age we really can't do much there isn't much productivity that we have so really the life that we have is very short and in this life the experience we have the human experience we have is driven by certain inputs by certain sources and I want to narrow these down to three and then challenge you to think of anything else besides these three everything that occupies us from the time we wake up to the time we go to sleep can only fall into three categories one our thoughts two our emotions and feelings and three our sensory perceptions and experiences sensory would be the five senses so what we see what we hear what we smell what we taste and what we touch now I challenge you to think of anything outside this that occupies you during the day when you interact with other creatures human or non-human when you interact with this world or this place that we have come into to exist for a limited period of time from the time we come enter the world through the wombs of our mother to the time we exit to the grave at the cemetery between these two entry points and exit points is there anything else that you can think of that occupies you that acts as a mediator between you and what you interact with whether it is a living thing or a non-living whether it is human or animal whether it is an object your life your spouse your children your job the country you live in the clothes you wear the car you drive everything you see desire you limit it to these three you are driven in your understanding of religion your understanding of what is right and wrong your understanding of what your goals in life should be your understanding of how to conduct yourselves to these three thoughts emotions and physical senses the five sensory perceptions so these are our inputs now the difference between those who are conscious and awake versus those who are in a state of heedlessness is that those who are in ghafla when they engage in these three sources or three mediums they are completely identified by them so that they don't see themselves separate from them and I will give you examples to make this clear when they think thoughts they completely identify with those thoughts as being their thoughts they are not able to see that some of those thoughts are from shaitan or some of those thoughts are angelic 
and they are a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it's an angel whispering or a devil whispering they completely identify that these are my thoughts when they feel feelings they completely identify with these as my feelings I am angry I am sad I am happy I am filled with lust or I am filled with anger they completely identify with the emotions and when they engage with their physical senses as well they are completely in that experience they don't see themselves from outside as someone experiencing those or interacting through those five senses in opposition to these are those who are in a state of wakefulness those who are in a state of wakefulness they are rooted and connected to something higher they are in a constant state of remembrance of their origin so they still can experience and enjoy the life of this world but they do it in a sense that is detached they can see their thoughts coming in and leaving their mind they can see an emotion enter and leave their body they can see themselves and reflect on what they are doing when they are engaging in something physical whether it is pleasurable or painful now let's take a few examples if you're going to say the salat ala muhammad wa ala Consider for example a person who loses his temper and in an unguarded moment becomes extremely angry and starts hitting his child. He may regret it afterwards but at that point in time while he slaps his child, hits his child, punishes his child, humiliates his child, abuses his child, puts down his child, he is completely identified with those emotions and thoughts because he is asleep, he is in a state of ghafla. Someone who is awake will never do that because he never says I am angry he says there is anger in me there's a big difference when you say I am angry and when you say there is anger in me you don't identify with that emotion when we have an argument with our spouse when we fight with someone at work when we're sitting in traffic and someone cuts us and we honk and we shout and we race with them and we show them the finger and there's four letter words being exchanged we are completely identified with that experience when we sit to eat something we love when we eat that food with lust and pleasure we are completely identified with that sensory experience of taste when we are watching a movie we are completely into that movie there is no sense of I am experiencing something as a spiritual being. On the other hand, one who is wakeful, it is almost as if he is above his body and he is watching himself from above. Imagine for a moment, billah, if I was hitting my child, but at that point in time, I was able to see myself like a camera from the top of the room and now I'm watching from above my body hitting the child it would be a very different experience wouldn't it because now I don't identify with that imagine I'm eating the same food that gives me pleasure but I sit and reflect on what is it that is happening this is a physical body that needs food for energy there is a hole in my face that is called a mouth there are bones on my finger here in my skeleton that can lift the food I know this might spoil your experience afterwards when you're eating but stay with me for a moment and think about it I lift this food and I put this in the hole in my mouth and then there are bones inside that break this food and chew and there's a piece of flesh in my mouth the tongue that gives me the taste and then I gulp and there's a pipe that pushes it down into my stomach now I eat with a very different sense and attitude there is utter humility I witness the miracle of what is happening here the health the breath the way the body is digesting this food and every morsel I eat there is a sense of shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there is a sense of gratitude there is a sense of humility that how humble and weak and limited this body is but how great this spiritual being is that it is able to recognize the creator of this whole universe and this experience that I'm having right so that same thing this one is eating this one is eating this one is getting sweet taste this one is getting sweet taste this one is getting salty taste this one but the experience is very different one eats with greed with lust with arrogance one eats with 
a wakefulness, with humility, with dhikr of Allah. And this is why Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He says, it is better to eat with the remembrance of Allah than to fast, a mustahab fast, while you are in a state of ghafla. Because the end goal is to become awake, to be a dhakir or a dhakira. وَالذَّاكِرِينَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا وَالذَّاكِرَاتِ So one person fills his stomach and then burps with delight and says, Alhamdulillah. And another person eats just what he needs and says, Alhamdulillah. But there is heavens and earth difference between that Alhamdulillah and this Alhamdulillah. They are not the same. Now, if we take this discussion a step forward, when we look at humanity today, we find that most people are unhappy. And it's amazing how some people don't even realize this, but the moment you ask them, are you happy, and they think about it, they say, no, I'm not happy. Why is it that Allah creates us with so much love and sends us to this world to find Him and promises us Jannah and gives us such beautiful role models but we are still miserable, life is not happy, we seem to be just endlessly struggling like a donkey tied to a mill going round and round endlessly, there doesn't seem to be any purpose to life. The reason why we are unhappy, we have found a reason and someone to blame. Usually we have found a reason. We either blame our parents because when we were young they didn't give us opportunities, they didn't realize our potential, they didn't send us to university, they didn't do this for us, they didn't do that. Because it's easy to blame someone, right? Don't realizing our children will blame us as well. Or we blame our spouse. If I wasn't married to this person I would have gone far in life or this would have happened. Or we blame our children. If I didn't have children I would have so much free time. I could have done this, I could have done that. Or we blame our boss. Or we blame the country we live in. Or we blame the system. Or we blame the, you know, the community. Or we blame or we blame. In the end we don't get anyone then we blame Allah. We don't say it but there is a resentfulness that if Allah wanted me to become such a great person why did he not give me the opportunity. So we are constantly looking at immediate reasons and cause and effect and looking for someone who can take the blame for why we are unhappy and why we have not succeeded in life and attained that great ideals that we had from the time we were youth. But I want to suggest that the reason we are unhappy is not the apparent reason. Even if you have just had a fight with someone and you think that is the cause of your unhappiness, that is not the reason we are unhappy as human beings. The reason we are unhappy is because we have lost that connection and that touch and sense of connection to our origin and our source, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I have said this before that because we cannot exist without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is impossible to disconnect from Him. But it is possible to be in a state of ghafla so that you are not aware of that connection that already exists. And because we have lost that sense of the presence of this origin and source, the presence of Allah constantly in our lives. So he says himself, Wa huwa ma'akum ayna ma kuntum. He is with you constantly wherever you are. Ud'uni astajib lakum. Call me, I will answer you. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِ عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ When my servant asks you about me, I am sitting right beside him. I am with you. وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ We are closer to you than your jugular vein. We cannot be any closer to you than what we are to you, Allah says. قَلْبُ الْمُؤْمِنْ عَرْشُ الرَّحْمَانِ The heart of a mu'min is the throne of Allah. La yasa'uni sama'i The heavens and the earth cannot contain me and hold me But the heart of a mu'min can contain me So he is so present with us He loves us so much He is constantly giving us attention We think of him, he is with us But we are asleep We are in a state of ghafla And because of this state of heedlessness And that is why Allah constantly tells us in the Quran That if you forget me I will not lose anything, but you will harm yourselves. وَمَا ظَلَمُونَ وَلَكِنْ كَانُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ يَظْلِمُونَ They never did any injustice to us when they disobeyed us, but they were doing zulm on their own selves. 
لا تكونوا كالذين نسوا الله فانساهم انفسهم do not be like those who forgot Allah so not he forgot them no so they forgot their own selves those who forget Allah he makes them forget their own selves وَإِذَا قَرَأَتُمُ الْقُرْآنَ جَعَلْنَا بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْآخِرَةِ حِجَابًا مَسْتُورًا When you recite the Qur'an, we immediately create a barrier between you and those who have no faith in the hereafter. Right? وَمَنْ يَعْشُ عَنْ ذِكْرِ الرَّحْمَانِ نُقَيِّذْ لَهُ الشَّيْطَانِ فَهُوَ لَهُ قَرِينَ Whoever turns away from the remembrance of Allah, we immediately appoint a shaytan for him, he becomes his companion. Then he keeps you occupied with the world. And that is where all the root of the unhappiness comes. That the moment you turn away from this remembrance of Allah. And the problem again here is that when we talk of Allah being present of in our lives, we think of Him in physical terms. Most people who say they believe in Allah, if you ask them who is Allah, they don't understand Allah. He's just an abstract concept of some being who created us. But who is Allah? That deep sense of realization that He is the only reality and the true consciousness and the origin and source of everything and nothing exists without Him. And He is present in every particle and everything that exists even at a beyond subatomic level. That total consciousness that everything is cannot escape Allah is missing in our lives in a very active sense. That is why the mystics say that if you, when an atheist says, where is Allah, show me Allah, I don't see Allah, what is the proof of Allah, it is as absurd. He is so present, overwhelmingly, that he appears absent because of the excessive manner with which he is present. And the example they give is, that if you went into an ocean and you spoke to a fish and you said to the fish, you cannot exist without water, the fish would look around and say, water, where is water? I don't see any water. Because he is so immersed in the water, he doesn't see the water. The one who is outside sees the water and the fish. So you look around and you say, where is Allah? I don't see Allah. He is so present that he appears absent. You are drowning in Allah subhanahu but you don't know that. So the idea that we are trying to get to, that the Quran speaks of, that Muhammad and Ali Muhammad salam, are telling us to get to, is to find this light of consciousness, to find this connection, to wake up to this reality so that we see when we put aside our mind-made egoic selves and we don't identify with our thoughts and emotions and senses and we look at it from the outside and we wake up to the beauty of this world, then, we, then life is beautiful, the universe is beautiful, death is beautiful, calamities are beautiful, you see the miracle of Allah in everything. You see the miracle of Allah when someone dies, you see the miracle of Allah when someone is born. You see the miracle of Allah when someone is rich, you see the miracle of Allah in poverty, you see the miracle of Allah in health, you see the miracle of Allah in sickness. And this is the maqam that Ibrahim salam had reached. That is why you see in the Quran when he talks about it, he attributes everything to Allah. وَإِذَا مَرِدْتُ فَهُوَ يَشْفِينِ And when I am sick, it is he who makes me well. He knows it is medicine that he eats, but he sees Allah even in that medicine. At every level he surrenders to him. And when we lose this identity, then we are always unhappy. Then we are always upset. Then we just need an excuse. Then everything irritates us. We are unhappy because of the mosquito that is buzzing around us. We are unhappy because there is traffic. We are unhappy because it is humid and hot today. We are unhappy because the stock markets fail. We are unhappy because the gas prices have gone up. We are unhappy because the wife doesn't stop telling us things and jabbing and making us, you know, annoying us and irritating us. On the flip side, when we find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then nothing annoys us. It's not because we now learn to control ourselves or we detach ourselves from everything else so that nothing can come and annoy us or make us unhappy. But it's because we are now connected to something deeper. We transcend 
the circumstances of life, the, the, the face value experiences and thoughts and emotions and sensory experiences no longer have the ability to control us. And so we rise above that. And now we are able to walk around as a being that is benevolent, that is compassionate towards humanity, that is filled with peace. There is so much peace within us then that when we sit in the presence of others we spread that peace and sense of oneness to others and they are attracted to it. And that is why you see it is in our fitra that we are attracted to people who are mystical, to people who are spiritual, people who are more connected to a higher being and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We find that this example is given to us time and time again in hadith as well. Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, for example, Salawatullahi wa salamu He says, Al yaqdatu nur. Yaqda is to wake up. In Arabic we say, Iqad min al nawm, to wake up from sleep. Al yaqdatu nur, Amir al Mu'mineen says, that when you get to that point in life where you shatter the ego and you wake up to reality and you're able to see your thoughts and emotions and senses from the outside and you become an enlightened being you are filled with light you get a sense that you have come out from darkness into light and Allah says this in the Quran again and again that obey Allah and his messenger come to the message of uh, uh, to, the, to what the messenger gives you uh, so that you may become alive right? that you may take from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam إِذَا دَعَاكُمْ لِمَا يُحْيِيكُمْ respond and answer the Prophet when he calls you to that which will give you life إِذْ كُنْتُمْ أَمْوَاتًا فَأَحْيَاكُمْ you are dead that means right now you're walking, you're talking, you're jumping, you're doing everything, but you are dead. You're not alive in Allah's eyes. Come to what He calls you, find Him, and you will sense that you have moved from death to life, from darkness to nur, from dhulumat to nur. That's why He says, Al yaqtatu nur. And in Ayatul Kursi as well, we talk, we say, Allahu waliyul ladina amanu. Allah is the guardian of those who have faith. Yukhrijuhum minad dhulumati. Nur. He takes them out of darkness into light. وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا And those who are faithless, أَوْلِيَاءُهُمُ التَّاغُوتِ Their companions are the rebels, are the devils. يُخْرِجُونَهُمْ مِنَ النُّورِ إِلَى الظُّلُمَاتِ They put them into a state of sleep. So what is this movement from dark to light and light to darkness? It's not physical light. It is from a state of heedlessness to a state of wakefulness. From a state of being dead to a state of the heart being awake and being alive. But the same Imam who says, Al yaqdatu nur, he laments that people are very difficult to wake up. He says, Anasu niyamun, people are asleep. Ida matu intabahu. When they die, they wake up. When the soul is separated from the body, then it's like a, you know, coming out of the water to take a breath and you, oh, I was asleep all this time. I missed out on the purpose of my existence. I did not live at all. He complains to his companions in Kufa. If you look at Nahjul Balagha, he says, is there no way to wake you up, O oh Insan? Is there no way to convince you to turn away from your thoughts and emotions and physical senses in this world and turn towards the dhikr of Allah. Is there no way to give you that hamasa, that zeal to be dedicated to finding Allah? He says, Ma li arakum ashbahan bila arwah. Why is it that when I look at you, I see you physical beings, skeletons that have no soul in them? You are like soulless beings. You are like just empty skeletons that have no life in them. You are awake, yet you are asleep. You are looking at me, you are present, yet you are absent. You are looking at me, yet you are blind. He is lamenting. He says, I can see, because he is an enlightened being. 
I see your physical bodies, but they have no souls. You are awake, yet you are asleep. You are present, yet you are absent. You are looking at me, but you are blind. And this is the lament of the Imams, of the Prophet constantly. That if you knew what we know, you would have cried a lot and you would have laughed less. You see in Hadith Al-Qudsi as well, Allah says, عَجِبْتُ لِمَنْ أَيْقَنَ بِالْمَوْتِ كَيْفَ يضحك? I am amazed at a person who is absolutely certain he's going to die. How does he laugh? You know, where do you get this jur'ah? To be so arrogant about life, to think that everything you have is because of your knowledge and your hard work. To trample on others, to humiliate others, to turn away the beggar, to have no time for Allah. It is a state of heedlessness until death comes and we are forced to wake up. So, as we draw to a conclusion, what we are saying is that as mu'mineen taking inspiration from all this and from the ayats of Quran, it is important that we stay focused. First I said to myself and then to all of you, that we should not be fooled by those who are driven by this world and who whisper into our ears this desires to excel and go far in life and in career. Certainly we should do that, but they make us forget the hereafter. And we live in a society where death is not only hidden, but God is hidden. You will attest to this, most of you who live here, who work in corporate world, who work in societies. Can you openly and comfortably talk about God at your workplace? Yeah. Right? What do people think of you if you start talking about God or Allah? So Allah has been removed from the workplace. Look at the TV, look at the radio, look at the commercials. Religion has been made a private affair. You want to talk about God, go to your mosque, go to your church, go to your private place of worship and talk about religion there. You cannot talk about, the moment you talk about religion, you are seen as being someone who is odd or weird or backwards. This is what the world has become. It promotes, you talk about atheism, you talk about sin, you talk about wrong. Right? You talk about human independence, you talk about pluralism, everybody listens to you, puts you up on a pedestal. Right? The result of this is that now humanity is not only asleep, but they are unhappy and they look at everything from a material, physical and mind only. And so they ask questions, they say, if there was a God, why does he allow earthquakes to happen where millions of people die? If there was a God, why does he let a woman have a miscarriage? What was the point of her carrying a child for eight months and then losing the baby? If there was a God, why does a four-year-old child have cancer? If there was a God, then this old man who is in the hospital, who is suffering endlessly, aimlessly, why doesn't Allah take him away? Right? Everything is determined in a physical, material sense. And these questions people struggle to try and answer, the Malvi, the priest, everyone is trying to explain to it. For a moment, supposing we change our perspective and we see life as not a place we have come to stay, but a place where we have come to develop our souls, a place where we have come to find higher consciousness, a place where we have come to chisel and carve this soul so that when we die, our bodies that are pregnant with our souls give birth to our souls and a beautiful creature, a butterfly emerges from that cocoon. If we were to look at life for a moment from this perspective, none of these questions become irrelevant. Why? Because as a human being from the time I am born, I am driven to be materialistic. I am driven to be selfish. I am driven to fight for survival. I am driven to go ahead of others so that I can survive. I am not patient when I don't get what I want. When I see danger, I free and flee and run like a coward. Now, what is it that will change these attributes in my soul and change me from being a coward to being courageous, from being impatient to being patient, from being selfish to being selfless, from being materialistic to being non-materialistic? The only things that change it is suffering and pain and affliction. It is when I have to give away what I love that I learn to be non-materialistic. It is when I have to prefer others over myself that I have to be selfless and not selfish. It is when I have to face danger and not run away that I learn the meaning of courage and not to be a coward and overcome my fear. It is when I can't have what I want right now that I learn to be patient. So now suddenly the earthquake becomes a means to avoid materialism, to witness the power of Allah, to help others, to extend compassion for humanity to come together and overlook their hatred for each other. Suddenly that miscarriage becomes an opportunity to surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to turn in submission to Him. Suddenly, 
everything becomes a miracle and everything becomes an opportunity to grow the soul if it wasn't for all these calamities and suffering we would all die as materialistic selfish impatient cowards but it is because of sufferings that some of us grow and become the followers of those who gave their lives in Karbala, right? I haven't come to Maasai, but when you look at the history of Karbala, we always glorify this, how the mothers sacrificed their sons, how they went into sajda and did shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where did they get all this from? They got it from their self and their development of their souls from before. But if Karbala had not happened, if that calamity had not happened, then the opportunity to do that sajda of shukr wouldn't have been there. So the calamity becomes important. It becomes very important. So I want to conclude then by saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Inshiqaq says Ya ayyuhal insan, innaka kadihun ila rabbika kadhan fa mulaqih O human being, O insan, you are constantly struggling and you are constantly working very very hard and striving you don't know this but your struggle and striving is to find me, is to find Allah innaka kadihun Ila rabbika kadhan, extremely, your soul is struggling to find me. Famulaqi, and there will come a day you will meet him. Now, this mulaqi is liqa of Allah. Liqa of Allah is not in a physical sense because Allah is not a physical being. What is liqa of Allah? In a word, it is this higher consciousness and awareness which can be attained to some degree in this world. And that is why, in a final verse of Quran from Surah Al Jathiya, Allah says, that on the day of judgment, those who turn away from this, those who avoid the dhikr of Allah, those who only occupy themselves with this world, those who do not care about developing their souls to come to this point where they will meet me, they will not meet me. They will not get this liqa Allah. وَقِيلَ الْيَوْمَ نَنْسَاكُمْ كَمَا نَسِيتُمْ لِقَاءَ يَوْمِكُمْ هَذَا And it will be said to them, this day you shall be forgotten the way you forgot this liqa of Allah. And they will be told, And now hellfire shall be your abode and destiny, and there shall be no one to come to your help. And so, this is essentially the message to myself and to all of us, that yes, we struggle with life, we live in a world where Allah is not promoted, but we must never forget this message from Allah through His Messenger, through the Imams to the Quran. That our primary purpose in life is to find our Creator. And the Imams and the Prophet are the best teachers and guides for this. We have lots of role models and examples by which we can change some priorities in life initially and then all of them eventually. So that everything we do in life is driven towards finding this higher consciousness towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the best example we find, as I said, is from Karbala. Two nights ago, <coughs> we mourned for the young daughter of Sayyidul Shuhada. And she is known in the books of Masaib uh, in, 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 in history. She is known as Sayyida Ruqayya. But in the South Asian or indo pak tradition, she has come to be known as Sakina. And there are some narrations that say that her name may have been Sakina. And some say that Imam al-Hussein had two daughters. He had an older one called Sakina. And he used to call Ruqayya sometimes Sukaina. Because Sukaina is a diminutive. It means the little Sakina. But the word Sakina comes from tranquility. And the reason why Imam al-Hussein would have called this child Sakina or Sukaina is because she was not an ordinary child. Besides being the daughter of an Imam, she was extremely, extremely intelligent. And she understood matters where a four year old would not understand. And her presence alone brought this Itminan and Sakina to Sayyidu Shuhada. <laughs> he used to say, I do not like a home in which Rabab and Sakina are not there. 
the Arbab of Azar say that the four-year-old had this habit that every night she would sleep on the chest of her father. <laughs> and so she grew to this habit that she could not sleep. <laughs> you know, when we read the Masaib of Sakina, we say that after Karbala, this child <laughs> did not drink a lot of water or this child did not eat a lot of food. I want to say to you that Sakina did not sleep a lot as well because she could not sleep without her Baba. If she slept, she slept eventually in the Zindan of Sham. You have to think of this rationally from the perspective of a four-year-old. A four-year-old who in one day sees her brothers being killed, her Ammu Abbas being killed, her Baba being killed, the head of her father on a spear, her earrings being ripped from her ears, her dress being burnt, being tied in chains in a desert all alone. It is simply amazing the degree of Masaib that this four-year-old could take. And I've looked at the Musiba of Sakina in many different angles and I have seen that there were three main parts to which this girl suffered extremely and I will not be able to speak about all three I will speak about only one because each one of them is a Masaib in its own. <laughs> one was the Masaib of losing her Ammu Abbas and not getting water. There is a whole Masaib of how she waited for water and how she never asked for water after Abbas alayhi salam. She had this deep attachment to her uncle Abbas. You know Shaheed Professor Sipta Jafar uh, has this kalam and this ash'ar that he reads in Fadail of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas and you know he begins that by saying panch imamo ka raha ban ke sahara Abbas and in that he has a line he said chadare chinne pa yaad aya har ek bibi ko chadare chinne pa yaad aya har ek bibi ko har tamache pe sakina ne pukara abbas har tamache pe sakina ne pukara abbas the second musiba of sakina was that she had this deep desire to return to Medina and you will see that even at the Wida she asked her Baba that before you go can you return me to Medina <laughs> and that itself is a Masaib in itself and the third Musiba which was the greatest for her was her attachment to her father this Musiba cannot be justified with any amount of Masaib you recite because it was mutual the degree to which Hussein loved Sakina and the degree to which Sakina loved Hussein. <laughs> Some of the Arbab of Aza say that when Hussein was leaving for the last time, Sakina was holding the feet of the horse and saying to Sultana, do not take my Baba. But I have read another riwayah that Sakina thought my Baba will not leave without saying Wida. So if I go and hide myself, then my Baba will not go to the Maidan. So she went and hid behind the tents. And Hussein went around asking, where are you? Ya muhjata qalbi, ya qurrata aini. Oh, the apple of my eyes, where are you? And she came behind the tents and he found Sakina playing with the sand. And he lifted her and said, why are you sitting alone behind the tents, my child? She said, Baba, do not go and make me an orphan. <laughs> Mir Anis tries to capture this experience. That how did Hussein leave Sakina for the last time? <laughs> He says, Sakina began saying to her, Baba, Baba, you know I will not be able to sleep without you because I sleep on your chest. Usneka <laughs> 
اچھے بولے کہ بس زد نہ کرو صدقے میں تم پر شبہ ہوئے گی اور دشت میں ہم ہوئیں گے بی بی اصغر میرے ساتھ آج وہی سوئے گے اجرکم اللہ اجرکم اللہ I cannot understand how a four-year-old on Shami Gariba in the dark of the night where there are dead bodies lying all over. Why would a four-year-old leave the side of her mother? No four-year-old would have the courage to leave her mother. But look at her attachment to her Baba that she leaves her mother in a desert all alone jumping over dead bodies calling out Baba <laughs> because she wants to sleep and she cannot sleep without her say. When Zainab finds Sakina, she is holding the feet of a body that has no head. And there is a voice saying, Zainab ahista ahista, my Sakina has finally fallen asleep. When Zainab asked her, my child, how did you know this was the body of your mama? There is no head or clothes on this body. She said, my aunt Zainab, when I came out crying, Baba, this body was calling out, saying, Ilaya, Ilaya, come to me, my child, sleep for one last time. Ajurukum Allah, Sakina was taken in chains to Kufa and Sham. Wherever Sakina fell from the camel, the head of Hussein stopped and would not move. Hussein would not leave without Sakina until she came to the Zindan of Sham. In the Zindan of Sham, she would stand beside her brother Sajjad and look out. She would see the birds flying in the evening and say, My brother Sajjad, where are they going? He would say to her, Sakina, it is now evening. They are returning home. She would see little children holding the finger of their father walking home. She would say to her brother Sajjad, when will I go home as well? <laughs> she kept crying for Amu Abbas. Again, Miran is here, tries to capture this loneliness of Sakina in the Zindan of Sham. He says, Jab piyas lagti roke chacha ko pukarti, dukhte jokan shahe huda ko pukarti, aata na jab ko hi to khuda ko pukarti, jine se tang hoke kaza ko pukarti, kehti ti na chacha, na imam e umam rahe, rulwale ko adu rahe, rone ko ham rahe, khai tamach shimr ki, jab tak ke kha saki, sin kam ta, dukh bohat te na bardash kar saki. And on one night when she cried, Baba, and Yazid asked why she cried, and she was told, the daughter of Hussein is crying for her father, and he sent the head of Hussein to the Zindan, and Sakina saw the head of her father for the first time, the Arbab of Azar said, she put her cheek near the cheek of her mother Hussein. First she cried for herself. Abata, mani ladi aitamani fi sigari sinni. Baba, who made me yatim at such a young age? Baba, did you not see how Shimru was slapping me? Baba, did you not see my dress was on fire? Baba, did you not see my ears were bleeding? Baba, I kept calling Abu Abbas, he never came. <laughs> then Sakina saw the blood on Hussein's beard. Karima bin Tal Karim, she began crying for her Baba. Abata, mani ladi qata avaridak. Baba, who separated your head from your body? Baba, before Shimmer killed you, did he give you any water? Baba, who covered your beard with the blood of your head? She cried, Baba, Baba, until she fell asleep. When Imam Sajjad moved her, he rose crying, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. The ghassala came, the dress of Sakina was burnt and attached to her body. She could not remove the dress. 
She asked Sajjad, did this child have a disease? I cannot remove the dress from the wounds on her body. No, Ghassala, leave her. I will bury her the way she is. When this Kafila returned to Karbala, Zainab came to the Zindan. She threw herself on the cover of Sakina. Betty, you wanted to go to Medina. Wake up, Sakina. It is time to go to Medina. My child, I go back to Karbala. Your Baba will ask me, Zainab, where is my Amana? Wow, Zainab. Wow, Gariba. Mata, meu Zainab.